Hi, good morning everybody. I also want to welcome you today. My name is Karl Kasshofer. I am the head of the Molecular Diagnostics Lab at the Medical University of Graz. Now I'm in the lucky position that I can run my whole lab on Debian GNU Linux and we are also a sponsor of this event. So I thought additionally we could maybe bring a keynote speaker and so I want to introduce to you the former Debian project leader, uh, Neil McGovern, who is going to give you a talk on distros and docker, who can you trust with your data. Neil is also working with Collabora, uh, the company who tries to uh, help with development of LibreOffice, so I'm sure uh, you will give us a very technical and very good insight into all things open source and your experience as a project leader of the Debian project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. This thing's working. Um, so, quick introduction to myself. Uh, my name's Neil. As, as mentioned, I'm the Debian, well, until about two weeks ago, I was the Debian project leader. Um, unfortunately, I, I got invited to this um, in my previous term, which, was, which lasted a year. Um, but it's um, a lot of work, and I decided that I'd rather have a bit of a life rather than spending all my time on Debian and free software. Um, I've been involved, and, and I've been involved with Debian since about 90 something, 1996 or so. Um, it's uh, not my first Linux distribution I found. I think that was Mandrake or something back in the days. For those who can remember the uh, the, the Mandrake project, um, which I found at um, before going to university, but then quickly settled on Debian. Um, so we have, and, and so part of my other day job is um, I'm the current engineering manager at Collabora, as mentioned. So I'm fortunate enough to work for them. Um, Collabora is a organization that it wants to accelerate the adoption of free software um, in the industries, but not only the software itself, its philosophies and its methodologies. We believe it's a better way of writing software and making um, software in general in the industry. Um, so I made this about 10 years ago or so, and every now and again, I keep on seeing people with T-shirts with this printed on, which highly amuses me. Um, Debian has been going since, well, 2003, so at uh, DebConf in Heidelberg recently. Um, we had our, I think our 22nd anniversary party. So there was lots of cake and that was all great. Um, it's something that's been going a while and recently we've had um, this spate of using Docker for everything. Now, I might have a little bit of a go at Docker I'm not against containers or anything they work, but the, it's a recent phenomenon, and I think we, it's useful to remember why distributions exist and what they exist for. As I say, we've been going since um, 2003. So there's quite a bit to Debian, so 40,000 packages. There is a phrase that I used to hear that um, if there's a bit of free software and it's not in Debian, then it probably doesn't exist. Um, a bit like being on Google. If it's not on Google, it's not on the internet. If it's not packaged in Debian, then hey, who knows if it's any good or not. Um, and there's various things we try to do. So it's, it's making those 40,000 packages all work together and all integrate so um, that you know all your versions, uh, you don't end up in dependency hell. Um, providing security updates. So we make sure that our stable, for example, I think um, is supported for a year after the next stable release to make sure people have time to upgrade, that we're able to produce secure systems. And Debian does it in a particular way where we backport those security fixes. Um, so we don't introduce a new version with potentially new bugs or regressions. We just fix that. And it's also a single source of truth. 
this means that when you get software, it comes from the Debian project. You can add your own, but um, what you don't do is have random packages coming from all over the internet. There is a place where we know that this is supported. It's backed up by um, having it signed, so you know it's come from the project, and that you can trust where it comes from. But there has been criticism there, criticism in the past, certainly, that Debian is very slow, that we produce, a, for example, Debian only nowadays produces a release every two years. There was a point in time where we hadn't made a stable release for about six years, and I think that criticism was a lot fairer then, but what does that mean for if you're trying to write a new web application, for example, and you want to use the latest frameworks? So there's been various methods of working around this and trying to ensure that people can have this smooth flow and using the, the latest updates and, and making sure everything happens really quickly for people. And there has been a movement um, around what is lovely called developer operation, DevOps. So this is a workaround for sysadmins, basically. So you have a developer, and I've been one myself, who wants to use this latest framework, but those nasty sysadmins are saying, no, you can't. You have to use this old version because it's supported and secure. So it's a way of working around that issue. Um, but that is a real issue, and it's a hard problem to fix. And so things can go rather wrong if you try and avoid that. Um, I am going to ask a few questions of everyone here as well as it's first thing in the morning, and I think everyone needs probably waking up. Does anyone know what that is? JavaScript. But what? This is a function called leftpad. <laughs> 11 lines of JavaScript took down about half the internet by it disappearing. So this is, this is a function for, does anyone not know what leftpad is? Some people don't, excellent. So, JavaScript was missing a function, and its ability to pad a string, and okay, so that, that's something that possibly should have existed in the, in the language, maybe not. So some enterprising fellow produced this function, which um, pads strings for you, great. And they hosted it on GitHub. Okay, that's not bad. You can complain about GitHub being a sort of a proprietary platform, but fine. Unfortunately, in the JavaScript world, um, what people did is they pull in these functions automatically from GitHub all the time. Um, the node.js community particularly does this well of pulling in random versions. So you have a load of applications which relied on a particular version of a particular library. That's fine, except they also downloaded it dynamically from the internet every time. And the developer, for a variety of reasons, took it down from GitHub. And suddenly all these applications couldn't find their dependency and it disappears. And then half the internet stops working. So there was big uproar, it, it got redone. Um, there's some not so entirely spoof services, but there, I think it's, if you, so I think it's leftpadasaservice.io or something like that. So you can call, so in, instead of calling out to GitHub and, and pulling down your application, what you can do is you can, you can do a JavaScript API call to yet another um, application and so, Maybe people didn't quite learn their lesson there. Um, so it's, it's all the wonderfulness of, um, of leftpad, but with added HTTP overhead every time you want to pad a string. So great. So there was a few, there was, there was a few options discussed on how to do this um, and how to solve this. 
Um, one of the things which surprised me slightly was a um, consideration that maybe when you're building your application, what you should do is get all your dependencies and statically compile them and then nothing will change. So you have everything in a big blob that um, will guarantee to work forever. Now, that again sorts out the problem of you're using old libraries, for example, on a distribution and it's not compatible, so you have everything bundled together. Um, so people know what static linking is? I hope so. <laughs> for those that don't, it's basically you get your libraries, you bundle it all together, and then it all works as a whole. Um, does anyone know why that might be a bad idea? So a few options, we'll go into those. Um, but let, let's sort of think back a little bit to when I first started using computers years ago. Um, and you had this wonderful concept called shareware. So what you did is you downloaded a binary from the internet. Um, who knows where it comes from? And then you download it locally and install it, and it's got all its dependencies in there, and that's brilliant, right? Because everything will carry on working. And, well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, we do seem now to be in a place where, essentially, what people are doing is downloading static binaries, but they happen to be called Docker containers. And it has everything you need in it. And again, what could possibly go wrong with that? Nothing in theory. Pop quiz time. I know what I like to do at half nine in the morning on a Saturday morning is look at CVE numbers. CVE numbers are the, a, is the aim to try and make sure that um, vulnerabilities are classified throughout the world with the same number. Who knows what this one is? Hey! Heart bleed is right. Okay, so, major issue that came out a um, number of years ago. Next one. It's getting harder. Where else could I go and cite CVE numbers and have people actually know what they are? I thought this, this might take at least five minutes of people guessing, but no, apparently CVE numbers, okay? Poodle. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't have a shiny logo. Apparently, these days, the way to actually get attention is to have a, 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 a website with a little mascot and, and call it a cute name, and then suddenly, actually, your CTOs around will actually pay attention. And it's like, ooh, I've heard about this dangerous ghost update. That must be scary, or, or something like that. We need to fix this immediately. Which, to be fair, is a bit better than trying to cite CVE numbers and say, oh, it's, a, it's an important um, security fix. But why do I talk about these CVE numbers? Um, this was done in, in mid-2015, about six months ago. This is the number of Docker packages on Docker Hub that are vulnerable to these things. Now, th this isn't theoretical, so, so they, they, they had a look, and so let's have a look at the 2015 numbers. So that's 40% of packages on Docker Hub are vulnerable to things like Heartbleed, things like Shellshock, and things like Poodle. And okay, let's be fair, that's in there, or their user-created ones. So it's not their officially branded ones. So in the official packages, it's only 30%. Great. 
great. So we have 30% of packages that are vulnerable to these severe things and a good 70% that are vulnerable to more minor things. I think Poodle is in, the, in, is in the minor list. So if anyone particularly cares about, say, keeping your data secure or people in the middle not being able to look at your thing, that, that's counted as a medium severity issue. Um, and this is where distributions can come in. Now, it's not saying that things like Docker, for example, or that containers are bad in themselves. There's some very useful um, security um, benefits that can bring. But the reason that distributions do things as they do is to ensure that this consistent and that this secure operating system can exist so everyone can do their work. So next time your sysadmin um, tells you, no, you can't have random new versions, there might just be a reason for it. And at the end of the day, it's about trust. You can trust, hopefully, the Debian project to produce a distribution, and you know where it comes from. Um, you can trust that updates to that distribution won't break things. Yes, it might be slow, but it's fixed. You will only get security updates that fix security holes. You can, so, so for example, a, a good thing about Debian, which I'm slightly terrified or proud of, I'm not sure, but I have a Debian inst uh, install that's been um, the same installation since 1999, and I've just updated it each time. So it's gone through all the stable distributions, it, it's a, and it's still the same install. Now, you can say, is it the same install? If you have a brush and you replace its handle 15 times and its head 25 times, is it the same brush? But I'm counting it as the same installation, partially because it has the same host name, but hey. Um, but you can trust that it will remain working and it will continue working. It provides a stable base. Um, so, but who do you trust when you download Docker containers or any other sort of um, container, essentially, from the internet? We are going back to the days of just random shareware binaries there. And what we seem to be missing is a way of making sure that whatever we are running is secure and knowing where that comes from and providing that trust path and, in sh and making sure that when we have something installed, we know what's there and so we know what's vulnerable and we know how we can fix it. Um, and that involves essentially auditing what we have installed. And that takes time, and that's slow, and that defeats the point of DevOps, which is that you can just install random stuff quickly and it will work and until you get hit. I think the use of containers will continue for a while and then continue to spread. Um, and it will require a somewhat catastrophic security lapse in something before people start to remember why distributions do what they do. And apparently taking down a third of the world's websites with 11 lines of JavaScript isn't big enough of a failure, but hey. So in the end, it's, I, I, I do feel like I've had a, a little bit of a hard go at Docker and, and everyone involved in DevOps. But my plea there is to try and remember what we're trying to do as distributions, what the whole free software movement is trying to do, is trying to produce something that can be used, is useful, isn't full of security holes. I remember when I was quite a bit younger laughing at the amount of times that um, 
Windows Update produced a new security fix and you had to reboot it and something and think of that, oh, well, in the free software world, that doesn't happen as much. For anyone who knows how Docker containers um, can work in a, in a full clouded environment, um, you'll know that the way to do that is turn it off and on again and then you get a, a, a new cloud. Oh, I should point out there is no such thing as cloud. It's just other people's computers. So, I sort of, sort of bring this to you and I, I'm aware I've got a bit of a time constraint. Um, I guess the question is where do distributions exist in the future? Um, you, if, do I have a prediction of what happens post this stock crash? Now there's two options, either people realize that um, Yo dog running a VM in your VM in your VM is excellent or something like that because that's what containers are um, and that all blows up in everyone's faces and it's a passing fad and it disappears. Does anyone remember Ruby on Rails? Or somebody actually works out how to create some sort of management for containers and what's in them. So people will know what's installed, what's vulnerable, what versions are in there. And that's quite a hard problem if you've got a thousand different images running all over the place which may or may not have things in them. Um, so sure, we can go down the container route. But please, let's at least try to make sure that we know what's running where and so we know that whatever's running isn't just going to leak all your details everywhere or send it to a random third party. Um, I'm aware of time, so what I'll do is I'll ask anyone if they have any questions, either on this or on my role in Debian or Debian in general, or anything really. Well, w within limits, I'll try and answer anything you want. So we have about, about five, ten minutes for any qu ten minutes for questions. So. Anyone at all? Ah. So, so for those that didn't hear it, a, um, there's an issue where a developer could fix a security issue and do a, a new upstream release, um, but not tell anyone. So no one knows that there's a security issue and, and where it's been fixed and what the fix is. There's, I, I used to do a lot of work um, with the security team as part of that for, for a number of years. Um, no, I wasn't going to call out any particular package names or name and chain them, but I will. Two particular bits of software come to mind. ClamAV, I'm looking at you. What they nicely do is fix some severe security issues, and to be fair, they tell you that they're fixing a particular security issue. Even great, they get a CVE number. So for anyone who's interested, if you go to security-tracker.debian.net, you can search that for any CV issue or any bit of software, and it will tell you that where these vulnerabilities are, what versions they've been fixed in, if they're fixed in Debian, if they're fixed anywhere else, and everything. Unfortunately, he produces this particular security issue with a load of ABI changes, and some changes in functionality as well. So you can't actually deploy that. So you could, you have now a choice if you're running um, some, some software. You can either leave the security issue open and still have your application working or deploy it and everything breaks. Great choice. The particular problem you're talking about though is not just an independent, um, an independent developer. This happens a lot in Firefox. 
Mozilla, sometimes I have seen security fixes go in with no mention in the change log at all. Nothing there. And this produces a problem if you're relying on a particular browser version. Now, what do you do about that? Well, partially Debian has given up um, for things like web browsers, it's now accepted that there's a, such a huge attack surface and the code base is so complicated that it's impossible, especially with upstreams, um, producing essentially just new versions of the software without pulling out those particular security fixes. It's impossible to support that. So what Debian now does is just um, ship the new long-term stable, the ESR release of Firefox. Um, and I've seen fallout of that, stuff breaks, stuff crashes. Um, you have new functionality um, introduced, but what can you do? If you have upstreams who won't, who, who don't understand the importance of producing minimal updates, then it's entirely left to the Debian security team to do it themselves and when it gets to, who are all a team of volunteers, and so when it gets to a stage where um, it becomes too hard to backport those particular fixes, then you either just say, well, you can run Debian, but there's no web browsers. That's not gonna work particularly well, and I wouldn't be particularly happy. So we've given up and just said, okay, we'll, we'll just have to ship the new one. Um, and it has led to, in some cases, a decrease in the stability that Debian is famous for, but there really is no other choice. Yes? So that question was, um, we have a, a talk coming up about own cloud. Is that something else that Debian's given up? I was at uh, LibrePlanet, the Free Software Foundation um, uh, conference about a month ago or so. Um, it's given a few talks about there, partially about how trademark law is terrible and how we need a GPL for trademarks. Um, you can find the video online. I know it's not the most interesting thing, but Debian people get interested by things like trademark law, excellent, um, and reading software licenses, we like that as well. Um, so the question is, have we given up? So I met with the CEO of OwnCloud, well, there, and tried to explain again why distributions do what they do. The key thing there is for a vendor, like OwnCloud, is to produce a long-term support version, something that they will support. And you went, oh, well, we do that with everything. It's like, well, no, you don't do that with all your releases. Because when Debian talks about long-term support, we're looking at four years. You're looking at for essentially, um, I hate to call it enterprise, because I normally equate with things which are labeled as enterprise as written in Java, very expensive and doesn't work. But and large customers who, say, run tens of thousands of instances want something that's going to be stable. And yes, Debian releases every two years, so it works for them. But I've had complaints from people that are going, why are you releasing every two years? Please, this is far too quick for us. We have 100,000 units. I, I can't update 100,000 units every two years. That's insane. So we now have a Debian long-term support thing for people who don't want to update their servers every two years. Um, but this understanding that when you release something, you need to support it for four, five years, something that can be there for, for long term. And essentially, part of the problem in, certainly in free software communities, is that um, we, because we're all different projects, we don't necessarily time things to coincide with each other particularly well. So we're all just working in our own releases and working things. But it's, so it's reliant on someone who wants 
to access the users of those very large organizations to make sure that they can sync up with what's needed. So it's up to them to pay attention to things like when Debian is going to release, when Ubuntu is going to release, when a new version of Red Hat is coming out, and then to sync up with that and make sure you have a long-term support version. Now, part of the reason Debian has to give up is we're a volunteer project. So we have about, last time I checked, about 8,000 contributors throughout the world who are all doing various bits, about 1,000 official Debian developers and about 2,000 Debian maintainers as well, so different levels of involvement in the project. Um, but even with that, with 40,000 binary packages, then th there's a limit to what we can do. So the reliance is making sure that we can, um, that upstreams need to do this essentially for us. So I have one minute left. Oh, yep. <laughs> Go ahead. Nice t-shirt. About, sorry? X screen saver. I'll try. <laughs> what is the Debian's position about X screen saver? Um, So we've had to deal with this before, what we call hostile upstreams. Um, I'm slightly confused by, by, the, by the upstream author here. They've released it under a, so, so for those that don't know, the X screensaver maintainer produced, uh, sorry, the developer um, inserted a little warning if you're running a old version, something more than six months old or something, that pops up a warning saying you're using old obsolete software it's rubbish, your distribution's terrible. Um, and they were complaining that it's like, oh, well, I get all these Debian bugs, and, and they're specific for Debian, and I fixed them already. Um, and I'm not sure he realized he'd subscribed to the Debian X screensaver bug list. So the reason he was getting all these emails, and I should point out with X screensaver, that's the only way to report bugs. It's just his personal email. He'd subscribed himself to that list, so he's getting all these bugs. What do you do? Well, Debian has to either patch it and carry your patches ourselves, which we don't like to do because that's work. And I, I should point out, Debian people don't like maintaining distributions. It's boring, it's dull. They shouldn't have to do this, but it's necessary. So we have to end up doing it. So we try and reduce the amount of work we have to do. Occasionally we'll have to patch things out. Um, but I suppose sort of wrapping up, um, my main point is that this, this isn't exciting, glamorous work. It's like, oh, what do you do? What did you produce? Well, I got some other people's software, and I put it together, and then I gave it to people. Oh, so you didn't actually produce anything yourself. It's like, no, I just got other things. It's not work, but it is important work that we have to do to try and make sure that everything works together. And I'm now definitely, definitely out of time. Thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day.